going to just go over briefly, and then we're going to leave some time for questions. We're just going to go over briefly what's happening now. So what is the culture telling us now? So we know that we just went over all the genetic predispositions. Now we want to go over a little bit about the culture. So what we have are these very rigid minds taking in information and taking it to an extreme. Okay, trying to... So orthorexia. So orthorexia is an obsession. So it's that mind. So, so I've been doing a lot of, this is a great new word, and everybody in the media is like, what is orthorexia? So I've done a lot of interviews this year. And the first question they ask me always is, so how could being healthy be bad for you? And it's the same answer as it is with food, weight, and body image. The degree to which your thoughts, your consequent torment, and your actions interfere with the quality of your life, your ability to be vital and spontaneous, ultimately your isolation, potentially your health, and ultimately they can be fatal. So that's, a, that's taking, you know, uh, you know, this is good for you to an extreme, because if you don't eat the salmon that jumped up the river in May and, and came backwards, you know, <laughs> you can't eat any other salmon, you can't go outside. So to the degree to which it interferes with the quality of your life, your ability to be social, vital, spontaneous, I love that word, and ultimately can be fatal, that's the degree that one is suffering from orthorexia. The orthorexic mind would then take the messages that are in the culture now, which is exclude this, because you'll be much healthier if you exclude this, and include this. So exclude, we can think of a lot of different things. Dairy, wheat, gluten, anything else, water, whatever <laughs> is, the, is the thing of the day. Um, and so to somebody, yeah, you know, so that might be helpful on some level, but to our eating disorder, rigid, perfectionistic, low self-esteem brains, if I do that, I'm going to be better. And so I take that to an extreme. Um, tends to happen in those genetically predisposed minds that are more anxious, more, whoop, more anxious, more depressed, more comparative, fearful of change, fearful of disease or harm. Okay. And... Okay, so that, we did this already. Good, good. Okay, so these are some of the foods that are being included. Um, you know, coconut water, chia seeds, kale, everything. I mean, and not, wait a minute, not just regular kale, massage kale, okay? And, you know, I don't even know where we're putting it these days. But, uh, you know, so that's foods that are therapeutic. And these are, and I'm, and I'm, an, I'm by, by the way, I am a nutritionist by training. So I'm not saying that you can't, you know, I do believe that you need to take good care of your body, and there's a way to take good care of your body, but I also have this heart, like, balance and flexibility, balance and flexibility, like, let, let the heart beat, balance and flexibility. So these are the reasons that one would either eliminate or be abstinent or exclude, and so... There's lots of good reasons, and they all make sense. But to the brains that are vulnerable and at risk for developing an eating disorder, these become very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at the difference. So this is another eating disorder, which we need to, the, you know, the physicians, the therapists, the nutritionists really need to look at this. Because if we went back 30 years ago, I didn't know this existed, but it did. And what this is, is a little bit different than any of the other eating disorders. The orthorexic eating disorder is still about getting, feeling better about self. If I eat a certain way, I become pure, almost to a religious degree, like I call it another religion. I call exercise and eating clean the new religion. Um, and to the degree that that exists, it's still all about food, weight, body, we rarely see orthorexia as clean and clear without it being top on top of anorexia. Okay, so, so it's like this era's new belief system about being thin. So it rarely exists without the being thin part. But ARFID is different. So ARFID, ARFID is about feeding disturbances and aversions to particular foods for various reasons, where somebody is not eating and failing to meet either their nutritional needs or their growth, okay? 
And what we look for is the same significant weight loss, the same failure to grow, the same nutritional deficiencies, <coughs> where they're depending on some type of liquid or internal enteral feeding. And there is the same market interference with so, so, psychosocial living and the same physical physiological consequences. Consequences, that's the word, consequences. <laughs> um, it's often specifically correlated to anxiety disorders, autism spectrum, OCD, and ADHD. Um, but it's not explained by, it's not better explained by there not being any food, by food or weight or body shapes, or any other medical condition. So this is what it is. So avoidant subtype, there's five types. Avoidant is about some type of fear, like some type of trauma that might have happened. Like It may or may not have happened or be perceived. So it's uh, purging, uh, I'm sorry, that's wrong, that's wrong, stop, 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 that's wrong. Vomit, the fear of vomiting, the fear of choking, uh, perhaps something like that happened in their child or just perhaps they, did, they saw something like that happen. So that's called the avoidant type. The aversive type is really sensory. It's about having some type of taste, smell, sight. It's very interesting, when I did the Anderson Cooper show, there was a woman on there with Arvid, and she, he said to her, well, what does that meat look like to you? And she said, poop. So her, and I call this the submerged caveman mechanism, where the adaptation of the genes hasn't really changed where the caveman needed to look and smell and hear and see things that were dangerous to him or to her. <coughs> and be able to say, that's not good for me. And I'm, and you know, the research is now about that gene and those traits not shifting in particular people. So that they're still, t like my grandson, when we, when we went to the restaurant, he has some version of this and we ordered something, and he, it wasn't what he ordered, so we can only eat particular foods. But when I said to him, what's gonna happen if you eat, because I'm curious and I'm a pushy, what will happen? So he goes like this, my taste buds will freak out. <laughs> He's like seven, okay? But I knew exactly what he meant, because that's the sensory piece, okay? Um, restrictive are, are the group of people in this place in this subgroup where they don't have any interest. They're not, food is not important to them, they're not interested, they don't care. Um, and then, the, then things begin to get mixed up when the culture comes along. So they may start out like this. So this woman that was on the show with us, she started out with all these aversions to food, taste, but then they took on food and weight stuff at the same time. So it kind of piles on. So once you start, so this is what happens in an obsessive mind. Once you start narrowing the path, it gets very narrow. And then whatever reasons you can put on top of it become new reasons. So the food weight stuff kind of piles on on the last two pieces. Um, okay, I'm getting my five minute get off. Okay, so I don't know what happened to this slide, but what it says is treatment. So the treatment for both orthorexia and anorexia, uh, no, orthorexia and ARFID, our exposure therapy, and it's really the what's been happening in the field. So when I started in the field, most of the talk, most, most of the therapy was about talk therapy. And what's really important now is that unless somebody is exposed to these foods and these places and these things that have narrowed the scope of their life, they stay there. You can they can feel better about themselves but the food is going to stay in place like that. So one of the things we do at our program and the programs around the country which weren't in place 25 years ago is really have exposure to eating and foods and different different experiences, food shopping, like people, you know, some of our clients will go into a supermarket and, and have a panic attack um, because they're afraid of the food on the shelves, you know, they're, they're, so, Exposure therapy, where first you're talking about it, and then you're creating images, and you're you're getting to the place where you you have a actual experience, but not just one, because if you have just one experience, you tend to go right back to where you were before. So if I was afraid of dogs, and you help me pet the dog, that doesn't change my aversion to it. 
I have to get to the place where I'm doing it over and over and over again, and my bodily experience and my intellectual experience has changed my, my perception of what's gonna happen when I touch the dog. <coughs> I like that. <laughs> so now, um, you know, the, the binge eating disorder is not a new disorder, but because we have finally got it onto the diagnosis, uh, the DSM-5, and we have some medications, uh, we are, we're actually able to talk about it more and people are able to talk about it. Like people before would think, I just like food and I just like to eat. And the medical profession is probably still in that place because most of my clients with binge eating disorder, when they go to the physicians, um, what they're told to do is lose weight. And that's a big problem because dieting what is what causes binge eating disorder. So I'm gonna not talk about binge eating because I'm gonna turn this over to Tanya. Tanya, and I'll answer some questions if you want while, um, while Tanya's setting her slides up, but then after Tanya talks, we'll open it up for, you know, this was just to provoke your thoughts, and really what I'd like to hear, really what we wanna do is create an environment where there are professionals in Long Island, on Long Island, who we can come to and work with, and can work collaboratively. We're here for you, and you be there for us. So this was one of our attempts uh, to do that. Do you want to say something, Randy? I do. Okay, come on over. <laughs> so it's with immense admiration and respect that I now have the opportunity to introduce our sponsor and speaker, 